Good afternoon, everyone. You might notice a different voice right now. This is Deb. Brian is not here this evening, uh, but we do have a familiar face, Dr. Cami Valdez, and she's going to take obviously very good care of us this evening. We are super excited about the topic. Um, it's something that everybody here should be, be thinking about. Um, and it's going to be, you know, about graduate school. It's just going to be a casual conversation um, with the panelists of uh, graduate students or recent grads. Um, be sure to ask your questions. Uh, this is an open forum. You can use either the raise your hand feature or the chat box um, or even the Q&A. And Dr. Valdez, I can help manage that. Uh, and then, you know, other than that, everybody, you know, feel free to take yourself off of mute and respond as well. Does anybody want to take themselves off of mute and share something good news? I'm just going to keep the thread that Brian does. Come on, Evan, you got something? All right, obviously I don't have the Brian Thomas charm, so I'm just gonna be quiet now and be in the background and Dr. Valdez, I'm gonna let you take it away. You bet, Deb. Yeah, it's it's hard to uh, to uh, be the same as as Brian and energy, but we will try to keep the energy up tonight. Um, so, welcome everybody. I'm excited for this panel uh, on graduate school, on considerations and insider tips, and I have three amazing panelists with me. Um, and so, I will uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, just uh, what we have here on the slide, but we'll get to know each of them a lot uh, tonight as we talk about um, grad school, applying to grad school, their experiences in grad school. And so uh, we've got folks in uh, different stages uh, going through the process. So um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Kayla Davis. Um, so she's recently completed her PhD at Harvard. Um, She's currently a AAAS fellow um, at the Department of Energy, and um, she went to undergrad at Oklahoma State University, and we'll do a fuller introduction in just a sec. Um, Rachel Fraser, uh, who is a PhD student at Columbia in neurobiology. Uh, Rachel did her uh, undergrad at Wellesley College in um, jazz, studies, right? <laughs> right, Rachel? Uh, but she also did research in neuroscience uh, while she was there. And so um, that's how the neurobiology fits in, which you all can, uh, we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, and then we have Ed and Germa, and they are a PhD student in astrophysics at Princeton, uh, G1. And uh, they did their undergrad at Harvard University in astrophysics as well. I, it was, it was double, you had double majors, Ed, and what was the second one? Um, it was astrophysics and math. Math, that's it. I knew it was, I knew there was a second one. Um, so a second major in math. And so um, really, really phenomenal uh, panelists that we have here today. Um, I'm excited to hear more about their experiences in grad school and any tips that they have for us. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and kick it off. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. So uh, I guess what I want to start with is uh, just having you all share a little bit about your uh, decision to go to graduate school. So um, you all are coming from uh, all different places and types of institutions and, um, and all came to the conclusion to do a PhD in STEM. Um, so tell us um, a little bit more about that decision and, and maybe also timeline. I think that's important, um, whether you waited to go um, to grad school or whether you you um, uh, went straight in. So whoever wants to go first, there's no particular order. Although I just it. pinned you, <laughs> sorry. It's gonna pin all of you. I'll go for it. Um, so I, uh, I guess I knew pretty early on that I was interested in graduate school um, during undergraduate. Um, I was looking at my career options and realized that a lot of the options that I was interested in required a PhD or more so that a lot of the jobs that I was looking at that only required a bachelor's degree were not jobs that I was necessarily excited about. Um, I um, had been doing a lot of research in my undergraduate and I was really still interested in continuing um, doing research and exploring that a little bit more. So I decided to apply to a PhD program straight out of undergraduate. Um, also felt like I was 
still a little young and I wanted to travel somewhere new, live somewhere different, get out of Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, graduate school is a really way, good way to do that. So um, I applied straight out and, and just kind of um, encourage everyone to definitely look at, you know, what your future career prospects might be and what degrees might actually be required or what salary you might be interested in making one day and what degrees are required for that. I guess I can go next. Um, so I also knew that I wanted to go to grad school uh, pretty early on, um, at least in my undergraduate. Uh, I am perhaps one of the dying breed of people who do want to go into academia <laughs> um, and you need a PhD for that. So uh, um, I knew it was a necessity, uh, but after finishing my undergrad, I was just as certain that I did not want to go to grad school right away. I knew that I needed a break um, of at least a couple years. Um, so actually, after I, after I graduated from Harvard, um, I ended up uh, taking a year to pursue some other interests. Um, I'm also very interested in music and um, after graduating, did a, a master's in music for a year and then spent the next two years kind of continuing doing artistic stuff. Um, and it was really the, oh, I don't know if someone was asking a question or talking. Um, yeah, it was, I guess the point where, where I decided, okay, it's time to go to grad school um, was last year and that, occurred for two reasons. One of them was um, I had been feeling that I really missed being in a scientific academic space and um, and was just, yeah, yearning for that, um, for that intellectual outlet, for that community again, um, and just feeling ready for, okay, I'm, I feel good about the idea of going back to my studies. And also, um, I mean, my graduate application cycle coincided with with the pandemic so i was home anyway good time to work on applications and the additional cherry on top was that the gre <laughs> was not required so i was like okay maybe this is a sign from god that like i should you know <laughs> apply now so that's i guess my my rough path <laughs> that's awesome that you got a master's in music i'm like so fascinated i want to talk more um but yeah, my, my path was a little untraditional, like as I've said, since I majored in music, I wasn't decided on that until sophomore year. Um, but one of my favorite professors was a neuroscience professor. And I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I'm really interested in neuroscience and music. And I want to do, I think I want to do research, but I had no idea like what a PhD was before coming to un like undergrad. Um, Cause I come from a pretty low income background. It was just like never, like a, I never fathomed it at all. And um, she told me that like you can major in pretty much whatever, but as long as you get like research experience, you could potentially do grad school or something along those lines. So I started re like doing research in her lab and then just fell in love with it. But I for a long time wanted to do med school as well. So I was pre-med and I thought I was going to do an MD PhD. Um, I had lots of conversations with Dr. Valdez about that and eventually decided um, to apply to the McNair Scholars Program. My junior year didn't quite get in junior year, but I tried again senior year and then I was accepted and through that process we had to apply for PhD programs um, and I got that experience and I was planning like okay I'll shoot for the stars we'll see what happens if I don't get in I'll take a gap year. Um, and then COVID hit and I was waitlisted. And so I was like, get gap year it is. And then I got off the waitlist, thankfully. So um, I ended up getting into my top choice, my favorite program that I applied to. So I was very like lucky and blessed for that. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, so it kind of spiraled and just happened really quickly. And it was a little, um, a little chaotic, but it <laughs> ended up being okay so far. 
Great. Well, thank you all for sharing um, a little bit about that decision and 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 the timing. I like the the pieces that you all brought into the conversation, right? Wanting to go to a new place, uh, get out of Oklahoma. Although, uh, Dr. Davis, I'm now back in Oklahoma, so there's nothing wrong with that uh, <laughs> after a long stint away. Uh, but also thinking about that angle. So, um, you know, both um, Dr. Davis and um, Eden, you brought up. Um, you know, what those angles were, like, why do I need the PhD? So uh, all these jobs that I'm interested in, or the salary that I'm interested in, right, that requires a PhD, um, as well as, you know, um, uh, getting an academic job, right, in order to get a tenure track job, you have to have a PhD. And so um, that's an important place to start also in this process of deciding whether or not a PhD is a right fit for you. So um, these are all really good um, points. And um, I want to talk a little about the, you know, application process, and I'm sure that our scholars want to hear a lot about that, um, because um, as they are, we're in October, applications are going to be due in December, we've got two months, y'all, to get these together, um, so let's talk about the application process, and so um, we have had many webinars talking about um, grad school application process, and if you are going to attend the um, LSMRCE conference um, later on this month, I will have a session on the statement of purpose. So we'll have an entire session just dedicated to that, um, which is this essay that you put together that's kind of like two pages of why you want a PhD, why you're prepared for a PhD, and all of that. Um, so that's one aspect of the application. There's, of course, the transcripts of official transcripts that you'll have to submit at some point. You'll have three letters of recommendations generally. Um, and then um, there's some bonus essays sometimes, depending on the program, they just throw those into the application, which you find out whenever you uh, start that process. Um, and um, as uh, Edin brought into the conversation, GRE, maybe. Um, we're still in the COVID times. There's less uh, requirements around the GRE. And there's actually a, a website called GRE Not Required um, that uh, some faculty have put together. So if you do not want to take the GRE and want um, and uh, want to apply to those schools, uh, there's a whole list and, and the STEM section actually is really well done. So um, check out uh, that, I'll put that into the chat a little bit later. But um, as you all think about those, uh, you know, putting together that, those application process, um, what, what stands out to you um, in the application? What do you remember? I know, um, you know, uh, Edin, this is super fresh for you. So maybe we can start with you um, uh, since you just went through that last fall. Um, but th thinking about that application process, what, what tips might you have for folks who are embarking on that right now and getting started, hopefully right after this panel? Um, because it does take a while to put this stuff together. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, first, the uh, I guess the main thing was that I knew because I was not only like applying to schools, but also applying to a number of fellowships as well. So in my case, it was the NSF, the Ford Foundation and the Hertz. Um, it's yeah, a lot of essays to balance. Um, and I'm someone for whom a time, like a very concrete timeline and like plan of action is critical. So I actually, um, I was, I just pulled up in my, in my notes on my computer, cause I still have it just like my plan, <laughs> my action plan of applying. Um, and over the course of, I would say, um, yeah, oh, basically from September through to the end of December, I just kind of charted out, okay, here are like all of the deadlines, um, here's when I actually want to be finished with things because it's always a good idea to have your essays done before, like, like at least a week before the deadline. Um, and then I just kind of, all right, like spaced it out so, so, so that, um, yeah, so that I could block out specific time to like work on each school, on each, um, on each fellowship application. Um, and I think it's also, that was also helpful because it can be very overwhelming to like, I don't know, just think of 
all that you have to do as a whole <laughs> abstractly. But if you break it up into, you know, the individual chunks, it actually is manageable. Um, so that's at least with respect to the time management stuff, what I found very helpful. And then in terms of, of writing the, the essays and maybe we'll get into like statement of purpose construction or whatever, but I was really surprised and grateful for how many students like actually shared their application materials online, um, particularly for things like the NSF and the Ford which have like very concrete um, guidelines for how you have to write those applications. There are people who like shared all of their materials and shared like the reviews that they had and stuff like that. And I highly recommend like looking at those things just to get a sense like formulaically how, how, to, how to write um, because it's, it's hard obviously to, to really make sense of it without seeing any sort of example. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a really huge help for me. Um, yeah, I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> I was, um, I had a very similar like plan of action and a lot of it was because of the McNair Scholars Program. So I'm super grateful for that because I didn't get started until also like September um, of the fall of my senior year and immediately we started talking about the GRE and like statement of purpose and I was like there's so much to this that I had like no idea about so if some of y'all like haven't heard any of that don't worry you still have time um but like Adam said like it's really important to get everything done like ahead of time and if you can get like a draft of your um statement of purpose before so you can send that to like recommenders and start thinking about recommenders ASAP because those are the things that usually take a long time or like some nudging reminders, follow-ups with people, because um, they're not always like, I mean, they're probably, if, especially if it's a good mentor, they're probably writing for a lot of other people as well. Um, so resilience is really important and persistence and um, being really organized. I had like a spreadsheet of like the different schools I was applying to, what they required, what they didn't require, if they had a GRE or not, and like just like different columns for all of the different things I could think about. Um, and that was really, really helpful with getting organized and, um, statement of purpose wise, just like trying to fit your entire scientific career and like motivations for doing science into a, like a really coherent storyline, I think is really important and something that flows and, um, shows like not just your accomplishments, but also, um, your passion and your interests and stuff and like how that's going to affect you, you as a scientist and like what you plan to do with that like for the world um, I think is really good and then tailoring it to each school specifically um, so it's good to have like a chunk like where it's just like the general stuff like this is my background and then like the last paragraph you can kind of like tailor it to the school more and just make sure you do research about like if they have clubs or organizations that you're interested in, um, if they have outreach opportunities. I think that's really important because um, they also want to see that you'll be like involved in the program and um, yeah, you'll be happy there as well. <laughs> so that's super important. And um, finding faculty members that you potentially would like to work with, depending on the program, you might have to go join one person's lab and so just write about their lab or if you get rotations then that's also something that you can mention like these are some people I'd want to rotate with so that they can see that you've actually looked into the faculty um, and that there's like multiple options that like you wouldn't get stuck with one person or something like that like you have backups so yeah I don't know if that's TMI but <laughs> that's what helped me so um, I feel far removed from this now, but I have helped a lot of students apply for grad school in the meantime. So um, I absolutely echo what Enon said, you know, you definitely read examples of personal statements there, you know, there shouldn't be, but there's kind of an unspoken convention of how these things are written and you just don't know what you don't know. And so go to the workshops with Dr. Valdez, read examples, ask um, your mentors to read your personal statement, they will make it better. And, you know, keep in mind that the people, the other people who are applying for the program, they are doing that, right? So you want to be on the same level as them. 
The other big piece of advice I would give is, you know, I think so many students when they're looking at graduate programs and when I started looking, I think I ended up with a list of like nine or 10. Um, so maybe we'll circle back on how many people applied to, but, um, you know, I applied to a broad range. So I had the dream school range, the middle range, the like schools I felt were safe for me. Um, and I think, you know, I kind of talked myself out of those dream schools. I just didn't think that I would be competitive there, um, especially with the GPA. Um, I didn't have a 4.0 GPA. I had under a 3.5 GPA when I applied. You do not need a perfect GPA to get into Harvard for grad school, right? So it's really about, um, you know, demonstrating your passion and that personal statement really articulating, you know, why do you want to go to grad school? Why do you think you're going to be successful there? And showing examples of other areas that you've been successful. And then finding those rec letter writers who are really going to be able to speak to that. You know, if you have maybe not the perfect GPA, maybe you have an advisor who can speak to that. Maybe you have a lab mentor who can say, you know, Kayla didn't have a perfect GPA, but she was in lab every single day, you know, these kind of things. Or when she spent the summer, um, you know, in my research laboratory, she really gave it her all. It was clear that she was passionate about it. She talked to me about applying to grad school, these kind of things that you can demonstrate. Um, and I'll just say, I was not as good about planning ahead as Rachel and Adam were. So I'm very much a last minute procrastinator. You should follow their advice. Um, I was super stressed out last second trying to get everything in like the last week because at least when I applied there are all these like silly components of the application that basically you take your CV and you just have to like manually enter it again instead of them reading it they want you to like say your grades for every class um, and manually enter these things or like all your extracurriculars into their program so it just takes time um, so make sure to take the time to do that. And also the rec letter writers, I was bothering two of my rec letter writers the day that they were due, they hadn't submitted yet. And I was freaking out. Don't get yourself in that situation. Find good, you know, tell them the due date is a week early or something if you have to, but, you know, stay on top of that. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, main, main sentence of advice is just, you know, really, really put a lot of effort into those personal statements. I've heard from people that have sat on selection committees that, you know, that and your letters are going to carry a lot of weight, um, often a lot more weight than your, your GPA or your, your GRE. So don't let those things freak you out. These are really great pieces of advice. Um, I brought up so many questions that I want to ask you all. Um, and I, I love that, um, you know, Dr. Davis didn't have me and uh, and a program uh, to tell her <laughs> the timeline, but uh, Eden and, uh, and Rachel did. So I was all about the timeline. So I love that you all uh, followed that advice. Um, and I know um, from working closely uh, with that in this last year, um, how much organization you had for your recommenders, which we'll come back to. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, and Kayla, you brought up a, a piece about um, how many schools you applied to. So I'd love to talk about that with everyone. Like how many schools, what was the range of schools? Did you, you know, how many did you end up getting interviews with? Um, and, and then um, what was that selection process like in, um, in picking a school? Um, so um, I don't know if you want to start first um, or Oh, and we can work our way backwards since you uh, since you started that conversation. Sure. So, like I said, I applied to nine or ten. Um, I thought I would get interviews at maybe two or three. Um, instead, I didn't get interviews at only two or three, and so I had like seven interviews lined up. Um, I was also still in my um, last year of college at the time, and so that was a lot to take on while also trying to finish my classes. So. Um, once those invitations started coming in, a lot of them are phone calls still today. People will call you if they want you to come to an interview, at least that's how mine went. Um, so, uh, you know, started getting those phone calls and they usually schools have, you know, two weekends that they'll offer, at least for bio programs. And, um, you have to pick one and put it on your calendar and like schedule to come out. So. 
Um, I started saying no to schools that were further down my list at that point and cut that in half. I ended up going on like five interviews. Um, and then for all of the schools that I did interview at, I got an offer from. So I think generally offer rates are pretty high, at least for bio programs. If you go to interview there, they have you there because they really want to meet you. They wouldn't have paid for your plane ticket and hotel otherwise. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I started making some pretty deep cuts at that point. A lot of programs are pretty quick to get back to you as well. So um, once I got, you know, my first acceptance, I canceled some others, knowing that there are still some folks who are on a wait list who could like still make that um, interview if they wanted to. I can go next unless you like to. <laughs> um, I had a very different experience, <laughs> um, which is okay because we have like a really wide range here, so that's good. Um, I only applied to about like six or seven. I was going to apply to seven programs and at the last minute um, something was wrong with my waiver for the application fee, so I decided not to apply to UT. Um, but I applied to, for me it was like location was a big thing, so I was like like East Coast, West Coast, or Texas. like. I did not look at anywhere in between. Um, I had spent some summers in Los Angeles, so I was really, um, I loved like the West Coast and everything. And um, I applied to a few dream schools. And like I said, I was kind of shooting for the stars. And I was like, if I don't get in, that's not the end of the world. Um, I only got one interview um, offer and it was for Columbia, which is my top choice. And I was getting rejection letters from other schools while I was at my interview. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, but then I ended up getting on the wait list, like I said, and then I got that offer um, on April 14th, which is the day before decision day. <laughs> they were like, by the way, do you wanna to come to Columbia? And I was like, I guess, yeah, okay, mom. <laughs> um, so that was definitely an interesting turnaround, but yeah, the wide range, I only got one offer and, um, got ghosted by some places they might just not call at all they might not send an email tell you that you weren't like accepted or anything you just like don't respond so that happens <laughs> but it's okay because hopefully it works out and it's all it's usually about fit as well um so like sometimes like it's just that you know you would have been like a qualified candidate but you're not necessarily a good fit for that their research interests of the institution or something like that and so um, it's really important to find programs that you like really are in line with and um, that'll help like with your your chances and stuff as well. Cool. Um, I only applied to five schools, I think. Um, for me, I was like, I think I think because when I was applying, obviously I wanted to go to grad school, but I also was like, uh, if I don't get it anywhere, like, I'll be fine. Like, I'll just maybe do something else. Maybe get some more research experience. So I, I guess I only apply to dream schools, which I mean, depending on your vibe, could work, could not work. Um, and the biggest factor, or I guess the main factors for my school choices were obviously like the research that was going on there. So I'm primarily interested in like theoretical and computational astrophysics. So I was drawn to schools that had um, just the most interesting faculty and research happening in those areas. Um, location was also very important to me. Um, all of the schools except for one were on the East Coast um, because that's kind of where my family roughly is. Um, and then also the, just the department culture, or at least like what I could glean of the department culture was very important as well. Um, for example, one of the reasons why I applied to and, and chose Princeton was because of um, how small the department is and the way in which the size of the department allows for people to know each other, um, to know each other more and and encourages just like a much more like friendly and collaborative and collegiate environment. Um, so those are, yeah, those are the main um, aspects for me that I was drawn to. 
Um, and I ended up getting into all of the schools that I applied to, which was really crazy. <laughs> Still crazy. Uh, and how that process looked, um, I all of my interviews were like Zoom interviews and um, where like I was interviewed by, um, generally it was like two, two faculty, sometimes also a grad student joined the interview um, and they would ask me about like my past research experience um, about what I was interested in pursuing, like as a graduate student research wise, um, asked if I had questions about the school. Um, so, so it was all like, I was informed about the interviews by email and then had the email, had the interviews over Zoom and then um, got acceptances either through email or like through the phone. Um, so yes. All right, well, thank you um, all for sharing about that and very diverse experiences, um, kind of going through that process. And of course, Ed and going through it in the COVID times online and having to do the interviews and not get to see the campus in the same way, right? So that's definitely challenging. And some of you may also be facing that this year um, because we're still in the COVID times. And so, um, you know, hopefully we're gonna be able to have travel again, but. But um, I think this year may be a hybrid model of some type um, where some places invite you to come to campus and others do not. So, um, yeah. So um, uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about just in the application process. And again, if, if you all have questions, feel free to be putting them in the chat or the uh, Q&A function um, so we can be bringing in your uh, voices. And very soon I have two more questions I want to ask before I start uh, bugging you all to ask questions in the audience. But um, one of the questions I want to talk about is recommenders. So you all talked a little bit about statement of purpose and the application. And again, we'll have a session on that at the uh, at the conference. But I want to talk about the recommenders because students usually have a lot of questions about recommenders um, because it's hard to pick. You got to pick three people. Um, sometimes you're allowed a fourth person to um, to serve as a recommender. Um, so how did you choose those people and who were those people kind of for you? Like what roles did they play, either research, teaching, jobs, et cetera? So um, let's talk a little bit about that. Whoever wants to go first, no pressure. I'll go again. Um, so my recommenders, my three were, I had an um, undergraduate PI at my undergraduate university that I worked with um, during the school year and at least two summers. And so um, she was very important to get a letter from. Um, I had another letter from a professor whose lab I worked in for a summer um, in an REU program. So. I spent a summer at uh, Harvard Medical School working in a lab and got a lab from him. Um, I thought that it was important to show that I could be successful in more than one lab environment. And so that's why I chose that. And then uh, my third recommender was a, a teacher who I worked for and I served as a um, TA for his biochemistry lab class. And so I thought that was a good, um, demonstration of my um, overall grasp of the material um, that I could actually, you know, teach it to students in the lab. Uh, and so, yes, those are my three. My undergrad PI and him were the ones that turned them in the last day. So, uh, <laughs> I haven't quite for forgiven them yet, but, you know. <laughs> I like, I like that you're still holding on to that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Rachel or Eden? I can go. Um, uh, I had four recommenders that I asked, um, all of whom I picked because I felt like they saw very important angles of my like potentials and strengths as a researcher. Um, Cammy was one of them uh, because I was a Mellon Mays fellow and, um, and she was the director of program at Harvard and saw me blossom over the course of, I guess, two years. 
Um, uh, my second recommender was um, a professor at Harvard with whom I did a lot of different research projects with. Um, his name is Avi Loeb. Um, um, my third recommender was a professor um, who was the supervisor of the senior thesis course um, in my in my department program, and uh, he and who was also and maybe this is also another line of strategy. He he is also like um, the director. I think at the time he is like the director of admissions of graduate admissions at Harvard in the astronomy program. Um, so I think it's good to think, ob obviously you wanna have people who like know you well and like know your strengths well, but it also doesn't hurt to have people who are like in good positions. Um, but he, yeah, so he supervised the senior thesis course um, and, and knew me through that angle. And then the last person um, was another professor at Harvard who, um, who ran this research program that I did over the summer after my sophomore year. Um, and it was like a 10 week program. And he also taught me in, in a astronomy class. So he knew me both as a student and also like as a researcher. Um, yeah. I, um, I chose people who I, who I had lab experience with. Um, but my first recommender was like my PI who I was in her lab um, since my sophomore year. And I also took classes with her and I TA'd for her as well. So she got to kind of see me in a lot of different lights. And um, part of the summer undergraduate research program for her was like taking students to UCLA where she still had a relationship with her postdoc there. Um, and he was like a tenured faculty member there. So I got to work with him two summers in a row. So I asked him for a letter of recommendation since he had kind of seen me um, through my relationship with my other PI. And, um, and then lastly, also through that PI, I was able to go do some research at Florida International University um, and collaborate with some people there. Um, and we're actually working on a paper still <laughs> um, from that research, but he, I got to see him a few times, um, like on spring break, I got to go to Miami to sit in a room and look at fruit flies. It was great, um, but he was able to write a recommendation letter for me as well. Um, even though he didn't know me like as a student necessarily and I only saw him like a few times out of the year he like we had a lot of conversations about graduate school he was one of the people that told me that like he would much rather prefer a B student than an, a perfect A student because it shows that they can like recover from like failures or not always being perfect and stuff which is really important in grad school um so we had a lot of conversations about that so I knew that he knew that I was interested and um I figured he would be a strong recommender because he was also um, like a tenure faculty member and my PI wasn't yet. So I think it's important to kind of get a range as well. Um, like I was saying, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a question in our chat asking about if uh, you haven't gotten to know folks very well yet, then um, who do you ask? And so uh, my advice uh, is you should start getting to know your faculty. Um, you know, you need to go to those office hours. You need to make sure that they know you and that they know that you're interested in graduate school. Um, most of the folks that are on the call are LSAMP scholars. And so um, you do have your LSAMP, um, you know, uh, either coordinator or director, right, who could be um, one of those letter recommenders who should know you well. Um, but also you want to make sure that you're getting those faculty letters of recommendation. So if you don't, um, another question that kind of coincides with this sometimes is folks are like, oh, my PI doesn't know me that well. I worked really closely with a postdoc or a graduate student. Um, in those cases, you could either ask them to co-write a letter. So they're going to co-sign the letter, which means that the grad student or postdoc is going to write the letter and the PI may or may not edit it and then attach their name. Um, or alternatively, you ask the PI for the letter because again, you do need that faculty name on that letter. Um, and part of that is from the committee, from the selection committee standpoint, they're wanting to hear from somebody who has trained graduate students who has or has trained undergraduates who've gone on to be successful in graduate school. And so they want somebody who can judge um, 
how how well or poorly that may be um but judge uh basically you know whether or not you'd be successful in grad school to be able to kind of try to extrapolate from at this point where you're at in, in your training you know how will you be able to be successful and so um sometimes if you ask the pi to write the letter the grad student or postdoc is still going to write it but the pi attaches their name to it so um you know so you always want to ask that pi um if you really feel uncomfortable asking the pi um you could ask for a co co-written letter between the two so um that would be my advice and again if you don't know them well start getting to know them there is still time um but start going to office hours or scheduling some appointments or trying to you know meet and talk about data and then be like oh by the way also i'm really interested in grad school like hey do you have any advice right and start asking them questions engage with them make sure that you're you're you know both sharing about yourself but also wanting to learn about them and and let them be part of that that process with you so um I'll also say, um, you know, you want to ask early for these letters. Um, so you want to be asking, you know, six weeks, four weeks in advance, four to six weeks in advance. Um, so uh, most applications are going to be due anywhere from December 1st to 15th. And so um, fairly soon uh, you need to be making these ask. And so um, be be getting on top of that. Um, I know um, uh, I share with my students uh, a spreadsheet that they can use to help get organized organized on applying to grad school, but then they can also edit or uh, kind of either hide some fields or delete some fields and then they could share that on with their um, faculty recommenders and so that can be really nice and um, help uh, the recommenders to know you know what are the deadlines coming up what are the schools how where am I supposed to submit this am I going to get a link or do I need to email it somewhere um, and so that's really helpful um, and of course always um, you know follow up with your recommenders with a thank you note um, so um, that's always appreciated by faculty I have two here one of which is Eden's uh, letter from uh, thank you note, uh, this one here um, from from last year. And then the other uh, the other thing on faculty recommenders that I'll say um, is make sure you let them know what happened. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so Eden's laughing because I use I use them as an example. Now, I'm sorry, Ed, and I do it all the time. Um, Lots of love, um, but I didn't, didn't tell me what happened, right? I wanted to know. I was going to, but I, I just I was know. overwhelmed, right? <laughs> Oh, they were overwhelmed with all the acceptances. Um, so, so anyway, so I didn't know what happened, and I, I was looking at the uh, at the calendar, and it was April fifteenth, and that's the decision day for most of these grad schools, and I thought. I wonder what happened with Edmund's applications. And so I wrote, I wrote them an email and I said, do you owe me an update? Uh, in which she, they said, uh, yeah, I got into all the schools I'm going to Princeton. So uh, make sure you let them know. Um, hopefully you don't have as passive aggressive uh, mentors and recommenders as me, um, but you're gonna write them so that they know. So please do follow up. We spend all these times writing this, these letters and we wanna know where you're gonna end up. And even if it's that you didn't get in, that's okay. You can say, you know what? I didn't get in this cycle, but I really appreciated everything you did for me. And, you know, I think what I'll do is I'm going to be a technician for a year, or I'm going to try to apply for postbacs and I'm going to need your support with that or whatever it may be that that is, you know, what you're thinking will be next or, hey, actually, can we have a strategy meeting? I'd love to talk with you about what I should do with my life uh, and when I get ready to reapply, um, you know, for this next year. So um, make sure to keep those recommenders in the loop. Um, so I have one more question that I want to ask. And, and again, if y'all have questions, please be putting them in the chat. So I, I appreciate um, the one that's already been entered. Um, but the one thing I want to ask, um, you know, I've asked each of you to be part of this panel um, because you all have really diverse backgrounds. And I would love to hear how did that either factor into your application process or how has it impacted you while you were in graduate school? Um, so I'd love to, to bring in your identity and talk a little bit about that. Again, this is a panel for LSAMP. So this is for students of color interested in, um, you know, applying to grad school in STEM, um, which all of you are. So um, I'd love to hear anybody who wants to jump in on that topic. Um, let me know. Not all at once, though, of course. I guess I can go on um, because I would say the, the first thing um, something that is really central 
to my desire to want to go into academia in the first place um, has to do with, you know, addressing structural social inequities that are both manifesting and like perpetuated in or through like academic work. And that really influenced how, it, I mean, it influenced every aspect of <laughs> my application. Um, primarily looking at like the personal statement, um, which is supposed to be this sort of, you know, um, you soliloquizing on like what on the research you do and why and blah, blah, blah. But for me, it was also really important to emphasize that like my desire to go to, to get a PhD and enter academia was not only connected to like intellectual things, but also like um, very socially oriented goals that I had. So I made sure to mention like as much as I could and in as much detail as I could, um, just the passion that, uh, that I have um, for teaching, for example, um, how I feel like as a person of color, like the education as a tool can be so powerful and how I want to be a future educator who can like wield this tool in order to um, address social inequity. Um, so that was, yeah, that was one, I guess, big component. Um, and I guess also another aspect of my, of my experience outside of like um, social racial things uh, was just the facet of like other, other interests that I had outside of science. And as I mentioned earlier, I took like a couple years between like undergrad and beginning grad school. And those years were primarily focused not on science, um, but on music. And it felt important to me to also um, describe, I guess, the role that this plays in my life currently and the role I envision it playing in the future because I, I intend to keep doing music things and, and um, artistic collaborations and stuff like that. So I actually ended up um, on a, for a lot of schools, you'll find that there's like an additional information um, section where if you want, you can write an essay describing whatever else you might want to mention to the admissions committee. And I, I use that as an opportunity to write about um, just the artistic things that I have done in both during undergrad and also in the space between undergrad and um, my application. Um, and also use it as a, as a way to kind of, yeah, connect, connect the artistic stuff to the science in a meaningful way. And um, I, yeah, just give a, like a larger or more round picture of who I was as a person. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll jump. I'll jump in and go ahead. Um, so, why did I decide to do this? So, I, you know, I um, when I was in high school and beginning of of undergrad, I I really thought that I wanted to go to medical school, and I think that was primarily because the only thing that I'd really been exposed to in my community for folks that were interested in science as a career was to be a medical doctor. Um, and so, you know, I, I identified with that um, when I was in high school, the only opportunities that I really had to like pursue my interest in science were through like volunteering at the local hospital um, or shadowing doctors. And so I just kind of jumped full fledged into that. And I, I got really, um, lucky that a, um, a high school teacher, you know, saw my interest in science and, and introduced me to a PI at the local university. And so I started working with her and that kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, you know, I can help people in this way, just understanding basic science and that can make big contributions um, without having to see patients and be a medical doctor necessarily. Um, 
like Eden, I had a lot of other interests outside of science. Um, I was really involved in local politics. Um, I was also really interested in human rights work and campaigning and protesting about issues that uh, were near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in high school and undergrad kind of wrestling back and forth how I was spending my time um, getting involved in things like um, mock government programs in college, um, leading an Amnesty International chapter in high school and at my um, university, and also doing the things in lab, right? And so, um, you know, it, it took a long time for me to figure out how I could kind of marry the two. I was like, surely there's a way I could um, make this work. Um, now I've kind of figured out how to do that. I'm doing a science policy fellowship now, happy to chat with anyone that, um, you know, share all of those interests and, and think that they might want to go that route. Um, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, but I, I think that I always, you know, kind of had this feeling that I wanted to give back and do something more. Part of that kind of came from my identity of um, belonging to a tribe, the Osage tribe, and they really do a lot to take care of their community. And so that instilled kind of this sense of importance in giving back to me. Um, and so I have always tried to do that um, because <laughs> I have really just gained so, so much from being involved. Sorry about the sirens out there. Um, so yeah, I think that's, you know, that I, you know, I, I will say um, I had no clue about like what grad school was at the beginning of um, undergrad, the PI that I worked for kind of opened my eyes to everything, told me about the internships I could apply for, the OKL SAMP program, like changed my life, having good mentors, having the requirement to apply for programs um, for the summer, having the requirement to apply for graduate schools and telling me how to do that. Um, so take advantage of the of your LSAM program, guys. It's just an incredible resource. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll pass it off to Rachel. She has something to say. Yeah, I think I had like similar motivations um, as both of you for like wanting to be kind of the change um, that I didn't see a lot of. And I remember going to Abercam's conference with the McNair Scholars, and it was amazing and it was so awesome to see like so many students of color um presenting their research and stuff and then they showed us statistics at like and during one of the the keynote speakers presentations and it was just the amount of like latina women in academia and then in tenure were just di like dismal they were just so small and it was both crushing and super motivating at the same time and um i've recognized the importance of good mentors in my own experience like dr valdez and um dr wasserman and stuff and to see like people who look like me or who share similar backgrounds is so powerful and like me knowing that i can do that too um and because of that i've just always really been interested in doing the same thing for someone else and being that bridge for somebody else um and that's what keeps me going during the tough times like especially at columbia where there's maybe 10 female faculty for 100 male um, and not very many of those women are women of color. And it's um, just like, we hope and we pray that it's like changing and so we're a part of the change, but just it's taking a long time for some of the, the institutions to catch up to that. So um, yeah, that, that informed a lot of why I wanted to pursue my PhD and why I still do and education was also really important for me. I did um, something called the ABC Scholars and I was a tutor for them and it was young girls from different um, socioeconomic backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds um, that got like a second chance or like a better chance by, by going to a school at Wellesley because um, it was a higher economic <laughs> A location it was kind of problematic in that way because it's like you have to take them out of their community to like help them succeed um but it was really amazing to work with those girls and they inspired me so much every day and they kind of like pushed me to continue i like to tutor them in science and stuff and so um they pushed me a lot too to continue on the path and just like yeah teaching young girls and young young people just from different backgrounds and stuff was always really um inspiring for me and one of the reasons why i like 
thought about doing academia in the first place and um, why I still hold that desire, um, even though sometimes it goes in and out depending on, you know, the different things that happen, but yeah. All right, thank you. Can I, yeah, I just wanna yeah. add one extra thing because yeah, just kind of like what Rachel's saying. I mean, I know for me in, in, particularly when I was in like the midst of my undergrad, like, you know, so often being literally the only black person in a class of like <laughs> 60 people, um was really depressing <laughs> and actually I think one of the most powerful things of taking space after I graduated college um was just like um in those years I really I really kind of changed I guess they were very critical in just recognizing to myself that there was also so much more beyond like the university environment and like and and my feelings of inferiority were were just so based on like this illusion of like all of these like white guys being super smart when like the reality is like they're not really <laughs> like I'm or or not that they're not smart but um but I'm just as smart and capable and like anybody is just as smart and, and capable. What matters is like, is, is being able to recognize and having the encouragement and support around you. And I, and also if anything, um, the grad schools that you, that you all hopefully will end up applying to, like they're the ones who need you not to be like, so that they're not left like dusty and irrelevant, you know? Um, so I feel like going into the grad school application process with like with that mindset, like a, like a grounding in just my inherent um, worth and like my inherent potential was so vital. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it was it was really, really important. And also just like making sure I had people around me who, yeah, also in the moments where the the imposter syndrome where the inferiority complex creeped back in, like having having my friends, you know, still present to like gas me up when necessary, having my family to like to do so as well, like I think was really, really powerful. So um, yeah, I would also emphasize just like kind of bringing that together and, and um, taking all of that to heart too. If I can add on to what Evan said really, really quick, just, um... Yeah, put your whole person in your application too. I was advised to not talk about a lot of the things that I did to really emphasize on just the science experiences that I had, especially applying for graduate fellowship. Um, I did it anyway. And, you know, I got positive comments back about those things. You know, Kayla's well-rounded. Kayla, you know, really cares about giving back to her community, these kind of things. Um, and I will say, you know, like now being on the government side of things, every agency that funds science right now is like going crazy trying to figure out how to get a more diverse like workforce in science. They are begging for people with unique backgrounds who have different interests to come into science. That's who they want to fund. That's who they want to push forward, at least, you know, on paper in practice. I won't speak to, you know, what actually happens, but you know, put put your whole person out there um, and I think it will be celebrated by most people. Hopefully that's good news for my future, uh, you know, uh, federal grant applications as a Latina scientist in academia. Part of why that I, <laughs> that I did uh, come back into academia and in this uh, type of role was exactly what Rachel was talking about, like the numbers just being so abysmal and this representation Ed, and also talking about that, right? And so, um, you know, I felt like that was necessary. Like we need people who look like and represent 
represent um, us in, in the academy. And so um, that's part of why that I decided to uh, make a switch recently. So um, I we are at time. I don't know if there are any burning questions. Y'all have been super quiet in the chat. Um, so I don't know if uh, we're just been covering everything exactly like you were hoping to hear about it, but if there's any burning questions, if you want to either raise your hand or, or do the, um, or go ahead and put um, something in the chat real quick, we can try to do like a lightning round. Um, but if not, um, we will close out. I'll just give it a second in case there's anybody got any great questions for us. Also, Cami, I'm, I'm happy if, if you want to like, give my email to anybody, like if people have questions that they want to send through that. Okay, everybody is saying that. So um, Deb can do that um, in her follow-up. So um, I also want to remind everybody to be sure to take that survey um, on this session. So the link is now in the chat. So um, please be sure that you uh, complete the survey to tell us some feedback about uh, tonight's session. Okay, perfect. Anthony was going to ask Thank about that you contact. So much for this call. Thanks, Anthony. I really appreciate it. All right, I'm not seeing any uh, any burning questions uh, coming up. So. Um, uh, I just want to say, uh, yeah, huge thank you um, to our rock star panel, uh, Dr. Davis, Rachel, and Eden uh, for being here with me tonight. And also for you all just being so honest and authentic and really sharing your story um, with everybody. I feel inspired. I feel like, you know, a couple of things that stood out uh, from the conversation for me um, was that you don't have to be perfect uh, to get into grad school. Uh, it is a holistic process, right? They're going to look at the whole application and um, shoot for the stars. Um, so I feel like those are my takeaways from this conversation with all of you. And I'm so um, grateful to have uh, you all in my friend circle um, and that you all are willing to, to share your time with us tonight. So thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this call. Thank you all. Sorry, my video like randomly cut out. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Ed. no worries. <laughs> Danielle, do you have a question? I see you're unmuting, but maybe not. Got it. Just saying thanks. <laughs> Deb, do we have to do any closeout slides? I don't think so. I think that we're good for right now. And just remind everybody that come back next week to find out how to get your PhD for almost free. That's right. That's right. Next week, we're going to do a session that I'll be leading on funding your graduate school. So um, let's figure out how to do that at low or no cost. So uh, please be sure to come back next week. Same time, same place. Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. To register for next week as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Hey, Deb, Thank you also, just this. a reminder for oh. the conference, the annual conference. Yes, yes. So we also have the annual conference, everyone, October 22nd to the 24th. It just happens to be LSAM's 30th anniversary, and we have several different um, events going on to celebrate that. I will send that information out in the follow-up email with the recording and the survey link. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And then Deb, can we stop the recording? I'm trying to find it. <laughs> oh, there it is. It's usually floating.